Performance at the end of the day is how you define it in your context relative to the goals, objectives, and outcomes that you've set forth. At the highest level, it's winning. Did the team win or lose? Coaches end up getting fired because teams win or lose at the highest level from a performance standpoint. Sure. Sports performance is a general term that I think has been used to give people titles. Director of sports performance, director of high performance. It all kind of relates under the idea of exercise science, exercise physiology, and what our bodies are going through in the space of producing performance on the pitch. The performance training piece might be a way to add load, metabolic, cardiovascular, mechanical load to help improve the player development to achieve the performances on the field. Players need to be available. That is the message. Yeah. If you're not available to train, then you're not available to improve the team's performance. You're also not available for your own development improvement. Therefore, how can I put you in a potential starting 11 to improve the chances of us winning? I can't. So for me, strength and conditioning, athletic development, injury prevention are all the same things. Mm -hmm. They're just different words, but it's the same thing, is to help players be available to meet the demands of the environment they're about to walk into. Okay, we're back again here at the United Soccer Coaches Convention in Philadelphia. This is episode number 51, and uh, we got a guest on today who has been an uh, influence to me in my coaching education journey. Uh, his name is James Wagonshoot. He is a coach educator for both U.S. soccer and United soccer coaches, focusing specifically on the sports performance side of things. And like I said, I've learned a lot from you, James, so I'm really happy to have you on so that we can go a little bit more in depth into some things that have crossed my mind as we've had these, you know, uh, uh, as you've given certain lectures in, in the courses that we've had. So I guess before we jump into that, why don't you just give a brief background on you know, uh, what you do, who you work with, and, um, you know, kind of what you're doing now. Yeah, great. Well, thanks for having me here, and I really appreciate the opportunity. It's, In uh, fact, James, whenever we, sorry, don't mean to cut you off, but we had a, a, a podcast right before we came, and you were the one person that I told Evan where I was like, I can't wait to have him on. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for being here. My pleasure, and I'm really, I'm really excited. So thanks a lot for your time. Absolutely. And, um, the short version is, is I've, I've kind of done the gamut within soccer in the United States as far as being worth a youth recreational program. My little daughter plays rec soccer and I've also worked with Olympians uh, in their strength program and I've coached uh, professional players. I've worked with uh, a couple of different MLS academies, primarily in sports performance, sports science. I've worked with our youth, U.S. youth national teams. And uh, I've spent a lot of time in the coach education realm lately, and I'm really enjoying that space and, and really enjoying the feedback that I get and others give to each other in that space. And um, yeah, based in Colorado, and with being an educator, I get to kind of open up an opportunity to see what comes of way and, and pick and choose areas that I want to dive into. And so working with, with either individuals, clubs, organizations, uh, to help provide systematic programming as an overview and then allow them to adjust based upon their context. So really helping them understand and connect the dots between sports performance and what they see on the field and maybe perhaps things that are off the field. So you feel like coaching, coach education is more rewarding, fulfilling to you and what you are trying to, to present, the message that you're trying to put out there. My belief is that as I've gone through this over the last 15 years in a full-time capacity, that strength and conditioning, a.k.a. sports performance, kind of lives in a, a gym, lives in a silo, and it's separate from connecting with coaches and the development of their program. And I think that's, that's poor, and I think it needs to be integrated. And so that's kind of my evolution as a coach educator is let's break down uh, misnomers, misbeliefs, biases. Let's break down walls where certain things have to live in silos. Like, it needs to be integrated into a holistic model. And so by connecting the dots and connecting with coaches from an educational piece, uh, I think can be a really transformative area. Yeah, so you said something earlier, you know, strength, uh, sports performance, AKA strength and conditioning. I think the word performance is starting to be used a lot more. Yeah. So what does that actually mean? How would you define performance training? So 
Okay, so you just added a word at the end, training. Okay. So those are two different things for me. Okay. Performance at the end of the day is how you define it in your context relative to the goals, objectives, and outcomes that you've set forth. So at the highest level, it's winning. Did the team win or lose? Players are go and perform. Develop. Coaches end up getting fired because teams win or lose at the highest level. Mm -hmm. From a performance standpoint. Sure. Yeah. Sports performance is a general term that I think has been used to give people titles. Director of sports performance, director of high performance. It all kind of relates under the idea of exercise science, exercise physiology, and what our bodies are going through in the space of producing performance on the pitch. Mm. That makes sense. That's a and good And then way the training piece, the performance training piece might be a way to add load, metabolic, cardiovascular, mechanical load to help improve the player development to achieve the performances on the field. But performance is not just the strength and conditioning aspect is what you're saying. That's correct. There are different areas, right? So why is, I guess, performance training as a whole so critical to an athlete's development? In my opinion, players need to be available. If players the best are not of ability is your availability. This happens to our boy Pulisic, man. Yeah. That is the message. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah. you're not available to train, then you're not available to improve the team's performance. You're also not available for your own development improvement. Yeah. Therefore, how can I put you in a potential starting 11 to improve the chances of us winning? I can't. So for me, strength and conditioning, athletic development, injury prevention are all the same things. Mm -hmm. They're just different words, but it's the same thing, is to help players be available to meet the demands of the environment they're about to walk into. That's fair, yeah. Um, so you mentioned like, you know, the, diff the different ways that performance training might look relative to the level that you're at. At the highest level, it's about results, right? The, at lower levels, it's about, you know, being available, continuing to develop. But what would performance training look like at the highest level? So I don't think that the highest level performance training is that much different than the recreational training. I think from a programmatic standpoint, the difference is that it's highly individualized at the elite level. And they have either more resources, more money, more staff, more equipment. Uh, great example is let's take a U10 player. We know that a U10 player, boy or girl, anywhere in the world, is still going through a development phase with hormones. Mm -hmm. It's still, a female side maybe have just started their puberty and started their growth spurt. The boys are a little bit later. What do they need versus what do they want, right? They want to play, they want to participate, but they also want to get, have growth. They may need strength as a foundation. Some players may be a little bit ahead of the curve and already demonstrate strength in the ability to make a tackle. Other players may not. So if we program the baseline foundation of a strength, we may look at, okay, can you squat properly? Can you lunge? And we look at the eight movement patterns, hip, hinge, pull, push, gait, some basic things that they can do really well or they can't do well. Mm -hmm. And we progress them through that. I would apply the same thing to a team that I would be working with in the MLS. How well can you do these eight movement patterns? Okay, maybe you have some dysfunction somewhere, but that dysfunction also may mean that makes you amazing because mm -hmm. you're that dysfunction. So if we look at these eight movement patterns and we apply a strength foundational program that needs to translate to the pitch, we try to get more specific with the high level player and we may be more broad with a general prep program with the younger player where there's a larger window of time for them to show increases. So that reminds me of, I guess, a question that you were asked in one of the courses that I had with you, where basically they, they asked you what, what is the ideal fitness test for a soccer player, right? And we're talking about high level players. Uh, and basically your, your answer was there is, there is no test. It was the two mile, wasn't it? <laughs> one, Never forget one that. mile or one and a half mile actually you said you said <laughs> yeah right golly <laughs> no but you said if there had to be a test it would be the repeated sprint ability um with i think it was 
six sprints of 40 meters, being able to match your time, your top speed each time. But your, your real answer was that how you determine fitness level in a player is how well they're able to perform the actions that they need to perform at the highest level, at the highest speed that they're capable of. And when you see that start to drop, it, it means that their fitness levels aren't where the, it needs to be. I am so happy you remember that. It stuck I, with me. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I'm so happy you remember that. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, there's a, a, a gentleman out there named um, Gary Gray, uh, Gray Institute. The exercise is the test, and the test is the exercise. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, yeah, the 11 v 11 is the test. Yeah. Can you play 11 v 11 for 99? And then we saw in the World Cup, 100 minutes, 10 percent more. Yeah. 10 percent more. That's significant. Uh, so when we start to think about a fitness assessment to measure our players, repeat sprintability is massive. One of the other things that I think is highly underutilized in this country is max aerobic speed. And max aerobic speed is an assessment that can be used early that helps you understand essentially, okay, you need, to, you need 75 meters to meet certain threshold to go at a, a certain speed, but I only need 60 meters to do it. So then I need something different than you and we can individualize our programming based upon the numbers that comes out and the time it covers us. Uh, time to cover 75 meters or co time to cover 60 meters. And so that is not necessarily a test or an assessment from, a, uh, from an outcome standpoint, but it gives us a baseline to develop within. Because mm. I think one of the, because obviously we both played at West Texas A&M, so D2, and I mean they obviously had like a strength and conditioning coach, pretty good weight room and all that stuff. And there was one year where obviously like a lot of the fitness tests in college and just to begin with aren't really that good. Because, I mean, just like you said, there's not really one that kind of tests at all. And you kind of know that because there's so many different ones that coaches have you do. But one that stuck me was kind of like kind of what you said. is basically like they, fair, they base it off of like a two-mile time. But then from there, he basically built this whole thing out to where we were like kind of split into little zones or whatever. And we would all start on like the, like the goal line. But then some of us would have to go – 85 yards and back. Yeah. Meanwhile, you would have some of the center backs only going like 50 and back, but you'd have the same time. And so obviously, like they're just as tired as we are, even though we're going way farther than them. So I mean, that's it's kind of relative. Yeah, relative. And it was obviously it was cool because that was one I've never seen that before. But it was also just frustrating doing that one because you're looking over, seeing the other guys yeah. die. Why do I have to run more? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, it, it yeah. started with Cooper, and, and there's a Cooper Institute in Texas. Yeah. And, and it oh, came yeah. out of, you know, this idea of a two-mile run uh -huh. gives you a good assessment. Yeah, yeah. I would say that a mile, you can do the same thing with a mile mm -hmm. because it's basically like go as hard as you can for four laps or a mile. And players like it because they're done in six or less minutes. And then the, the mile and a half is the one that sucks because it's just a little bit more. But you really start to see the metabolic benefits of doing something like that. Uh, but it's a, it's a, t it's a so good, it's like good assessment. If there's not really a numerical value that you can, you can put on what a, a player's fitness level should be to reach the highest level, when you're looking at youth players coming up, is it literally just an eye test? Are they able to keep up with the speed of the game and really nothing much more than that? Or are there numbers and metrics that they need to more or less be able to hit? So define youth player because from in my so I, I, let's 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 talk about teens like you know that are ready to make that jump to college or maybe even a professional level. Got it. Yeah, I don't know that there's a singular number that I would be comfortable putting out to the world to say, okay, you 16s around the world around the country, if you meet this number, okay, you're ready to play college. The reality is there's there's two things that's happening. One is their physical biological body is 16 years old and they're male or female women have already kind of gone through their growth spurt maybe their puberty maybe they're on the very tail end guys are right in the middle of it so they're still taking on hormones they're still maybe having an extra room of growth so we need to consider that because that affects stride length and their ability to cover ground over distance the second thing is, is by the time that 18-year-old gets to go to college, and I just walked out of a presentation that reinforced something I learned a long time ago, our conscious brains aren't really developed until we're about 25 or 26 years old, our prefrontal cortex, which means that that 18-year-old, the 22-year-old, really is a 12-year-old to 16-year-old brain. Hmm. 
So neurologically, there's still room to grow and make performance increments. So for a player who's 16 years old that says this is the number, it, you've got to maybe meet a new number that's exponentially higher by the time you're 20. Mm. Gotcha. So that's why the, the context is so specific. Yeah. So I'm yeah. not trying to evade the question, but it's really hard to it's say. It's a lot of gray area. It's, it's a huge gray area. Yeah. And that's why, for me, the answer's in the game. Can they keep up with their player? If they're at center back, can they keep up with the forward and do it for 90 minutes? Right. Yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, and, and it, so <clears throat> I guess building off of that, um, trying to think how to phrase this, you, you want to see players take those steps, but the demands of the game are different for a team than they are when you get to college, and definitely if you take that next step and go pro. Well, let's, let's, the demands from a research standpoint regarding physiological capabilities are pretty well the same, meaning a player plays in about 85% max heart rate. VO2 max. Relative re to what they are capable yeah, of yeah, and, their, and their competition. Everything is relative, but gotcha. I'm, what I'm saying is if you look at the match demands and the research, it's at the highest level, it's probably the same. The reality is, is players that are youth are more anaerobic, so their heart rate's always gonna be higher. Mm. That doesn't mean that game demand is higher, it just means that their response to their moment in time is higher. Okay. But the real demand is around 85% of max heart rate, okay. generally speaking, and about 70% VO2 max, which tells you that 70% VO2 max, while helpful for long-term health benefits, longevity, blue zones, aging, is not as critical in soccer. It's more of that anaerobic repeat sprint ability, primarily on the emphasis to recover. So would a periodization plan for a teenager look different than a college player or a professional player? Individualized it could, yeah. yeah. Uh, from a team standpoint, most likely based upon two games a week, three games a week, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, at the youth level, you'll have a tournament. You'll play five games on the weekend, right? Yeah. It's like that doesn't happen in college. That doesn't happen at the professional level. An adult could not handle that kind of a workload, right? Maybe they could, like, if you, they really pushed it. But you're not going to have, like, their peak performance like you would maybe a teen who can recover a lot faster. So, you know, like, is the, is the training load and just the workload in general going to be able to be higher for a teenager, uh, a youth player versus like a college professional player? I think if I understand your question that maybe there's more bandwidth of capacity on a younger player and yeah. maybe it gets smaller as they get older because they've kind of tapped exactly. their potential from a, from a physical output standpoint. I would agree with that based okay. upon biology. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, you can, you can train youth players pretty hard and not give them as much time to recover, whereas, like, you have to manage that a little bit more as you start to get older. We even saw, like, a good amount of that happen kind of, I guess, right before the World Cup window started with all these teams, like, having players get injured because they're trying to force all these games yeah. into that same compact window. And then even if you look at, like, like Klopp's Liverpool, I think it was last year, the year before, where they – we're in every single competition up until like the last round and then you look at them this year and it's like they're kind of getting hurt they're a lot tired they're not able to keep the same amount of pressing up they're kind of doing all this and it's just i guess all that workload that they had just finally finally catches up yeah i mean what you're what you're talking about is acute and chronic and then cognitive load i mean in super basic terms and acute is basically what happened today chronics was happening over a period of time yeah mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so when Klopp first got to Liverpool, though, go back and look at the first season record regarding injuries. Massive, because a new style of play, high pressing, yep. coming from Germany, massive hamstring injuries. Mm -hmm. But players adapted. Yeah. Players adapted. Champions League winner. Yep. So you have to have time. The problem with college coaching, and I just heard it this morning, I'm a college coach. Our preseason, we got two weeks, maybe, maybe even 10 days, high school coach. Six days. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You can't do anything in that time. You can, but the problem is, is they think they have to do a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's counterintuitive a little bit. So that time should be used to lay a foundation rather than trying to get them to max fitness before the season starts. 
Well, I would say that it's the off season. Yeah, summer it's program like it matters. Yeah, the three to four weeks of what they're doing prior to them coming in matters to help lay the foundation because, and this might sound odd to those college coaches out there, but if they choose that environment. So right. they walk into that environment. You should know that you're only going to get a two-week preseason. You should know that you're going to have games, and you should know that your job is predicated on winning with a brain of a 12- and 16-year-old. So if you add too much of a cute load and those players don't do anything, yeah, recipe for disaster. Yep, yep. So going back to what you were talking about mm. with the World Cup. Yeah. You know, obviously the game, the game is evolving. Money is a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, FIFA wants to make as much money as they possibly can. Yep. All the federations do. So they're adding more and more and more and more and more competition. Yeah. So how is sports performance going to evolve as, like, the, the, the competition schedule increases and schedules are just more congested? That's a great question. And I think in many ways we're seeing examples, uh, to your point, about the World Cup come up in reality with what teams are doing. And I used the example yesterday about Croatia because I listened to a podcast just recently on the Science for Sport with uh, Luca, uh, who's the head of strength and conditioning for the Croatian National Federation. And he said, eyes, ears, then data. And he has the luxury of knowing players in a small country and where they play around the world and able to get their data and access to them. So he knows where they're at coming into the national team camp yeah. prior to the World Cup. So everything was highly individualized and things were not forced. Mm. It's a wonderful uh, 25 minutes to listen to. Is that something a lot of those uh, sports people, like, I guess, like his position, is that something that all the other national teams do as well? Yeah, absolutely. They're, especially in a World Cup situation where it is uh, all yeah, about winning, yeah. so you need as much opportunity to provide for them to win. So it becomes highly individualized. Um, we, as humans, adapt to the environment we're in over time. It is survival of the fittest. So if you can build robustness in the off-season, and durability, the chronic load, that can help prepare them for uh, congested, fail, uh, congested fixtures. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thursday, Saturday, okay, we're going into a tournament. Maybe two to three weeks prior, I purposefully overload them so that I can see who's durable to build robustness in them. Then I'm gonna taper down a little bit before the tournament but we've built in the chronic load that's not going to be lost over 10 days. Yeah. Now they go into that tournament, and they've already built that chronic load to be able to go deal with it. And it's, it's, it is the reality. It is the reality yeah. that we'll see more and more fixtures, and it's about building the durability and robustness in the, in the joints and the tendons and ligaments and the brain to say, yeah, I can do this. I've been so, here before. Yeah. So just human evolution. More well, I don't know that if we've evolved a whole lot. We still want to survive and... Uh, <laughs> You know, basically have our basic needs met. Yeah. You know, but our, our brain, it was great. Like, our brains aren't designed to be happy. It's to survive. Yeah. And yeah adapt yeah. in that survival yeah. mode. So that's it. Stress, response, stress, response. Mm -hmm. As, you know, um, performance training, like, is adjusted based on uh, congestion of schedules, things like that. You have to manage workload. How does a player, like, at that level, at the top level, stay injury-free, stay fit, but then also continue to push their fitness levels as the season goes on. Consistency. They're a pro because they're consistent. Yeah, just putting in that deposit and every day. Exactly, that daily dime. Yeah, yeah that mm -hmm. daily dime deposit every day so that when you take a withdrawal, you have enough cash in the bank. It's a good way of putting it. They may not need to increase their fitness over time. And... I don't know Luka Modric, and I don't know his training program. You know that he's the heart and soul of the Croatian team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I keep referencing them because it's on top of mind no, for me. No, for sure. Look what happened to his data over the course of 90 minutes. No doubt. He didn't need to maintain fitness, but he needed to maintain fitness within the team style of play. Yep. And be in certain positions at certain times. So he could be jogging to that position because he knows he needs to be in that position. It requires less effort. It still requires effort. But if it's in the 89th, 94th minute, he knows I don't have to sprint now, but I'm going to have to sprint because I can anticipate what's coming in two to three plays. So That's very true. Insight. And so he has that game yeah. insight. I know what's going to happen in two passes. So I'm going to jog to here. Now I go to sprint. Yep. I know those stats are so just interesting. Even when they did like the, I saw one where it was 
basically breaking down the walkers at the World Cup and how Messi is just top of the list on that. Yeah. It's like, because it's such a, that's the, you know, the beautiful thing about soccer is it's like, there's no ideal way to do it. Like, there's no perfect way, like, type of player. Like, you could be, like you said, like, Luca, someone that walks, does that. Or you look at, like, a, I don't know, just some of your wingers out there just are so rapid, always constantly moving type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's why we get caught up in the emotions of players that are coming through that are 19, 20, 21 playing on the world stage because they've got that physical capacity you were mentioning earlier that, yeah, they, ooh, they can repeat sprint so many times. Yeah. But the older players maybe don't get such the, uh, the recognition. But, uh -huh. man, consistency, consistency, consistency. We know what to expect out of that player. Mm -hmm. And that maybe they're the unsung heroes of the team. They're the, they're the Mercedes Benz. They're the, they're the cog in the wheel that keeps everything going. And then you got these grease players that come in and screw <laughs> things and make it fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what exactly. the game is. It's a change of tempo. It's, mm -hmm. a change. Yep. It's, it's understanding the rhythms of the game. you got to have different players contributing in different ways to have that balance and and success as a team you know so no that's good so would you say like if I mean I think I know what you're going to answer to this but what would you tell a, a youth player that is aspiring to go pro like how do they reach that level on the performance side of things is it just consistency which is hard because they're variable <laughs> because they're kids they like variety yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So how do you help a youth player and understand the value of consistent deposits? Mm -hmm. Maybe they need an analogy mm -hmm. that resonates with their home life. And maybe it's, it is literally 10 cents every time to go buy the candy bar that they want. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I want the candy bar right now. Give me a dollar right now. No, you can earn it. Here's a nickel. Yeah. Oh, how many nickels do I need to be able to go do it? Yeah daily deposits in the, in it what i would encourage especially on a youth player is that it's okay to try new things mm -hmm. but be active don't resort because like a youth train you're not going to get it three days a week at a training environment you're yeah. not you're not going to get everything you need as a youth player who wants to be at the highest level in 90 minutes three times a week you're not going to get it you know, yeah you need not at all work how you do it when you do it who you do it with all those things matter so that you don't pick up an injury and derail yourself right but the daily strength deposit i'd say strength more than anything and strength is relative because you could get into like six different types of strength but foundational pieces of strength mm-hmm and that starts with balance and coordination. Yeah. yeah. Neuromuscular yeah. coordination. Just being able to control your body. It's brain. Yeah. It's brain. Yeah. Brain development. Absolutely. Well, James, you've been a big help to me. I know you've been a big help to a lot of other coaches as well. So appreciate what you do and thank you for your time. Uh, I know you got another meeting here pretty soon and got to go grab some grub. So we won't hold you too long. But uh, definitely this was a, a good episode, one that I was looking forward to. And. Hopefully we can do another one in the future. Oh, I'd love that. Thanks a lot for having me on, guys. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Thank you.